Oh, there you go. Danny in the big fish. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Good to see you, bro. Hey, what's up, man? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm cool. Let's see. Taking light, man. Lil' man, what's happening? Back at it. What's up, boss, man? How you doing? Yes, sir. I was good. You might want to hit me. Yes, sir. Do your thing, dude. Hey, Lil' man. Says some soul. Lil' man be in the streets tonight in Dallas. No, daddy, go home. Daddy, go home. I'm good. I'll be around. Hey, Pops, you got a fight coming up. You can't be in these streets. Yeah. First off, shout out, happy dad. We appreciate y'all. Bro, what's the, uh, what the tour been like, man? Like, what was the press uh, tour was, like? No, it was grueling, though, because they had us all over in California. Mm -hmm. And then after the after the press conference in California, we had to go to New York. We got there, like, 1 in the morning. And then me, I'm going to run as soon as I get there. So I got there, I ran, went to bed, like, 2 or 3. They were trying to get me up for the breakfast club. Right. <laughs> and, like, 7 in the morning, I was like, nah, I put my phone. Do not no, you ran, in the, you, ran, you ran through the city? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, I ain't run to the city. <laughs> nah, oh, see, it's messed up. Because when you say you ran, my mind went, I hit, like, I, I hit the know, street. You know, he thought that. We are it's right. funny. Oh, and then it clicked what you were talking about. You was like, I was like, ow. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you, can't, you can't hit nothing out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he's, he's like that, though. Even when he play, he's like the biggest game of his life, he gonna run the streets. Yeah, it was crazy. It's funny when you say I, that. Man, I, I used to do that, you know, until something happened, I just stopped. Can't do the same stuff over and over. Your body don't cope the same. No, <laughs> that's real talk. I'll be tired for like two, three days. <laughs> in, the bed, in the bed, about two, three days. So I, can't, I can't go out like I used to. Do you see, like, the building? One belt, two belts, three belts. Like do you see it? Does it get does it get bigger? Yeah. Every time that you. Oh yeah, for sure. I think like the press conference really gets you more pumped up because you know you're seeing each other face to face. Mm -hmm. His trainer's talking, my trainer's talking. So he's saying a little stuff to get me kind of ticked off. So I start saying a little stuff, getting him ticked off. So it really gets you pumped up, especially you eyeing each other face to face. The little face off, we staring at each other to get you ready to go. Wow. We watched, you know, the build up to it. Yeah. it. It's so much tension right now. And it's like, yeah. you always say, you'll be like, I, I respect him, but he can't really box with me. I respect him, but <laughs> he ain't fuck nobody. Like, you be like, but, but <laughs> you can't say you respect him, nigga, say anybody. <laughs> <laughs> nah, 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 you know, I respect him for sure. Like, I respect what he done done, and I respect his, his talents, but he, he hasn't proved, I feel like he hasn't really fought anybody. Yeah. And I just feel like, me versus him, I'm just, it don't matter who it is, you know, I'm just gonna run him over. Hold up, limitless, they can send me a cow pin in it. I fought the head to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless, they can send me a cow pin in it. I fought the head to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, Way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. This is not Errol Spence the second in your name. This is Errol Spence second time on the pivot. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And just to be, uh, have you here again, man, is a testament to how you continue to build, but also, man, to, to who you are and the way you grind. Uh, the last question I asked you, I said, I was like, but we gonna see it? And you said, you was like, every belt I have, I've taken it from somebody. I'm about to go get number three. You that you dang to act like you didn't have to fight uh, you guys uh, <laughs> that Saturday. You said I'm gonna get number three, and I'm not leaving until I get number four. And throughout the press tour, you said I'm a man of my word. Now that you have done everything to make the fight, right? 28 no, 39 and no, 30 knockouts, 22 knockouts. Who's the A side? Who's the who is the guy coming into this fight? I'm the guy for sure. I'm the I'm the A side. It gotta be A side, and that's why we was going. That's why the business side was kind of cause cause with him, he just didn't want to believe that, you know, I was the A side. Like I'm the big dog. When we talk about ticket sales, talk about putting butts in the seats, all that. Like I'm him. You know what I'm saying? And he didn't want to believe that. He was like, Well, I did this. I won these belts. I did this. That's cool. We try to take that to the bank. Yeah. That was somebody telling us, cool, all them accolades, cool, but take that to the bank and see what you get for it. Yeah. Man, you know what I'm saying? Man. Like, when we talk about putting butts in the seats, I can do that. When we talk about people viewing, I can do that. So, 
you know, he really didn't didn't understand it or, or didn't want to understand it. So, but you bring that up because I heard, like I said, there's been some media before this, and I'd have checked it out. And there was a FaceTime. Is that what happened? Yeah. Y'all talk. Yeah, we FaceTime. You ain't never got into what was that FaceTime about? Because that conversation, if me and him sitting here like I'm the dog, I'm the big dog. No, I'm the big dog. Bitch, fuck you. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know how that conversation go with y'all, but yeah. that's how it would go with me. How was that like when, because this fight, it was hard to get this fight, is what everybody understands. It was difficult to make this happen, but it's, it's happening. What was, what was that like when y'all actually got together man to man and figured it out? The first time we FaceTimed, it was more of a, just a fill out. Like, we were just talking on the phone, talking about family, talking about life. Talking about investments, all this type of different things. Talking about, you know, the state of boxing, what's it in, who's good. And we're just filling each other out, talking about kids, all that. And then we probably talked about the boxing part like five, five, like five, ten minutes. And then the next time we got on FaceTime, we started talking more about it. He started telling me, you know, the stuff that he was concerned about and the things he wanted. And, you know, it, it made sense to me. It made sense. I was like, yeah, yeah, I understand that. Like, he wanted to know basically, you know, about everything, where every dollar is going to, you know. So, and he wanted to be a part of it, and I understood that because, you know, wherever he came from, with Top Rank and Bob and them, they gave him no control over that. So he was trying to take control over his own career, basically, you know, and make sure everything structured out right. So that was kind of a, a big hurdle to get over right there and then with me, I really, I feel like I really got this fight because it was things he was asking for that, you know, Al and them was like, that I wasn't gonna, you know, they thought I wasn't gonna do it. And we talking about percentages. And, you know, I basically was like, yeah, like, like give them that, you know, this the fight, it's just the fight I want, period, regardless of, you know, anybody else or moving up, fighting somebody, like, I feel like I can't leave 147 pounds without fighting him. And he can't leave 147 pounds without fighting me, regardless of what he say. I feel like he's my dancing partner and I'm his dancing partner. Like, That's hard, you know though. what I'm saying? We meant for each <laughs> yeah, other. Yeah, I love that. So we got to make it happen. This is one of these legendary fights. This is like Sugar Ray not fighting Tommy Hearns. Correct. Or Tommy Hearns not fighting Marvin Hagler, you know, so. Is something that basically for me, I feel like it had to happen. With that, there's a lot of numbers involved. You were just saying you felt like you was the draw of the big dog, but they got you as the underdog. Oh, yeah, for sure. How do you feel about that? Uh, I really don't, <laughs> don't feel nothing about it. I mean, my people going to win a lot of money, but. <laughs> I'm your people. people. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel nothing about it. And, you know, I'm a rational person, so, you know, Baby, I should be the underdog if 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 you you know tell these under these people to do all the best and stuff. What I've been through, what the stuff that occurred in the past two three years. I mean, I should be the underdog. We talking about car crash, eye injuries, and and everything. So, I mean, if they read up on that, they would probably be like, yeah, we are gonna make him an underdog because you know tearing Crawford's his accolades and. Yeah, I've been winning, but you know, they see all that, they, you know, they research everything and see all that type of stuff and then, you know, make their draw on it. But I'm not sure about being an underdog. Well, I feel like that, that makes for a better story for me. You're talking about better stories, you ever thought about what your uh, Showtime or Netflix story might look like? Because last time we sat down with you, you had the accident yeah. and the fight. Then you just recently had the accident in December. Now you got the fight. I'm talking about perseverance and, and, and rebuilding and like that story itself, I think will be amazing on film. You ever think about things like that? Oh uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Like I documented a lot of stuff. Like I got videos and everything with, you know, no teeth, playing with my kids out there. Like they, <laughs> they joking with me and I, my eyes swollen, you know, I got gash and everything. So yeah, I, I I had thought about it and I was like, man, I wish I recorded, but at that time I was too embarrassed to to have somebody <laughs> record me. Like I was like 190 pounds, like, you know, I, my hair was growing out wild, you know, and I was still and I was still wild too. Like after my car crash, I was still like going out drinking and everything and having fun, partying and everything right after my car crash. We talked about it, bruh. 
Get a motherfucking driver. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's talk real. You know, we done sat down. Now it's our second time sitting down, bro. Your ass can't drive. Your ass do not need to grab a wheel the rest of your life. Like, get hey, a driver. On the, the court, I do need to get a driver because to this day, to this day, I'm still like I get I get nervous. And it's the fact that I'm so brave that I drive. Like, I don't be tripping. But I don't know if it's stupidity or what, but I, but I be nervous as hell. Like, even when I'm at the red light, like, I just envision, like, a car coming and crashing into me. Or when I'm driving, like, I envision, like, I can't even, I got to stay in the middle. Like, I can't drive, like, by the wild or nothing, because I just envision somebody hitting me or something like that. Or if I'm driving past a four-way lane, like, I just envision somebody or like running the light and hitting me. Mm -hmm. So it just be, it be things like that. I definitely do, do need to get a driver. I drive for you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, after this, after this, he gonna have enough to pay us all to drive. So, <laughs> man, we, we might need to do it for real. <laughs> to hang with, we got you, man. <laughs> Even with that, you know, Tanny talking about the driver, all that different stuff. And, you know, from your last fight versus Ugas, you know, to now, the time in between the fights, yeah. you know, a lot of things go on. How do you maintain your discipline, you know, your focus, knowing that this fight was potentially on the horizon? Like, how do you stay in it so you don't have to do so much to get back ready to get ready for this this type of fight? I just I just stayed at home, basically. I mean, I stayed at home all the time. Like, I barely I barely went out. Like, not I'm not even talking about a club. I'm just talking about went out period, like hanging out with friends, in and there. Like, I just stay home with my ranch. Kick with my kids, do so with my kids, do so with my girlfriend all the time. Like I, that's how I spend most of my time. Cause I don't get in trouble when I'm with my girlfriend. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's hey, I thought, about, that that. I thought oh, about that. I was like, man, I don't never get in trouble when I'm with my girlfriend <laughs> or my kids. Like it's always if I'm with my partner. So. <laughs> that's that's usually how we become partners, though, dog. Right. <laughs> that's usually how it happens. Yeah, like I'm never in trouble. Like when I'm with my girl, everything's smooth. Like nothing ever happened. But as soon as you know, I drift off, <laughs> hang out with my guy, some something happened. So I just kill it with my girl, my kids, and just staying out the way. I pop up in the gym, do work out of the gym, run. But it was basically just being at home, watch TV. The other thing that I want to know, like in listening to you, I don't understand the mindset of a combat sports athlete, right? Like I know what football is and what it's like to have teammates. And I know that if this dude, I can't really handle him, I might have Chan, I'd be like, Chan, man, you need to take this block on. Let me get around. For you, it's once I'm inside that ring, it's me and you. When you talk about having a conversation with a guy, you're talking about kids and you're talking about investments and you're talking about life and all those things, how does that affect you when it comes to having to go dismantle this man to continue your career and your longevity? I feel like I'm an apex predator. It's just like I can be in the locker room talking to my opponent, chilling. We can be playing dominoes in the locker room and it's fight night. Dominoes, playing cards, playing the video games. And then as soon as somebody come in, commission come in, be like, I was fight time. And once we get in the ring, is I don't even know you. Like I'm a straight try to decapitate you, destroy you. And I I don't know where that comes from. I guess it's just it's that it factor. It's what makes you know some people great and some people good and some people okay. Cause not everybody got that. You know that's what the instincts of of a Floyd or or you know, Manny Pacquiao or Mike Tyson, you know, Muhammad Ali, you know, I can, like even, like Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, you know, re got him reinstated back into boxing after after he uh, refused to go to the to the military. He had, like, he didn't even know Joe Frazier, he did that for him. Yeah. You know, we talking about him like a dog and, and they fought each other like dogs, you know what I'm saying? And that's how I am, like, it doesn't matter if I know you, you can be my best friend. You know, once we in the ring, my competitiveness come out, and I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't know you from a can of paint. <laughs> from as as far as boxing goes, E, you haven't experienced professional disappointment, right? Inside the ring, like you have just experienced success and being the best. The Olympics. The I, I was that that was going to be my okay. question. I said professionally. Okay. <laughs> right, professionally, because in 2012. 
you get outpointed, right? You guys appeal, and they say, okay, the guy held me, held you nine times in the third, and he spit out his mouthpiece on purpose in the second. And then you get that another opportunity against the Russians, and you get outpointed, or you lose 16 to 11. And you had to face that disappointment in moving into the pro ranks. How did that affect you, and what did you learn from that experience? That experience there, I feel like it really made me a monster because even when I, when I lost the first time and I had to, um, you know, get reinstated back in, like, man, I never broke down. I broke down on national TV. Like, it wasn't national TV. That's, that's the world. Like, the way I broke down, I just cried, and, you know, I was hurt because I trained so hard, and my goal was, you know, to win a gold medal. And for me, and especially when I lost to the Russian, I felt like I should have beat him. But, and I beat him probably, I beat him three, not probably, I beat him three months prior to the Olympics. So that would really gave me an edge. I'm like, man, I, I know I, I could have beat him. I should have beat him. So once I turned to pros, my whole thing was, you know, I'm not going to lose. I'm going to try not to let it go to the scorecards unless I'm just beating him so decisively, so decisively that, you know, the judges can't, there's nothing they can do. They're going to give me the decision. So for me, it's just, I just got to keep training hard and just stay focused. Is that during, like, when you out there and you throw so many damn punches? <laughs> You just slang and them. And he stay in the pocket, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. I be feeling sorry for them niggas. Like, God <laughs> damn, what you gonna do? But is that, like, when you think about that, like, okay, I can win this with points, or I gotta knock him out, and that thought process that you have during the fight, is that when you sitting down? Is that in the middle of the fight? Is that when you're talking to your trainer? Like, to be able to rationalize that, knowing that this dude that's staring at me is trying to knock you out, when is that thought, thought process happening where you can really decide, I have to do this or have to do that? Well, my, my thought press process once I get in the ring is basically to break them down. Cause I feel like a lot of these boxers don't train, they don't train like me and they're not willing to give, give it they all. So I know the body can only take so much before, right. before it breaks down. So if I feel like if I keep chopping you, it's like, it's like a drip of water hitting a brick. After a while, that water gonna start chipping at that brick and get through. So I just keep coming at him, keep coming on, keep touching him, keep touching him. And I don't think I throw, I don't throw, a, I don't throw a lot of punch. I just keep, I just keep touching you. I just keep, I just keep touching you. That's the thing. I just keep touching you. I keep let, putting my hands on, keep touching you, keep touching you. And it don't even be, like a lot of times, it don't be hard loading up shots. It just be, I'm touching you, touching you, and I'm just hitting you, hitting you, hitting you. And it's basically making your mind overthink. Cause your mind working too. Not only is your reaction reaction time, everything, everything working, but your mind is going to overload. So everything going to overload. And I just keep coming. And they they see me the eight, nine, ten round, and I stand up like, you know, like it's nothing. I'm so nonchalant. I should be like, <laughs> I'm gonna keep coming. So you know what I'm saying? You're in trouble. So, you know, I just keep coming to that will. Cause I just feel like the body can and the mind can only can it can only take so much punishment. You know how when you was young, you say, I want this for Christmas, and you yeah. get excited? It seems just following you on social media, like your confidence is different than yeah. before your last fight. It's like, you like, I want to show the world, like, this is the big one. I'm ready for this. You're talking about training and being ready, doing things differently, which brings me to this point. We've had some fighters on the show, yeah. right? A lot of UFC fighters that we've had on the show, they've done the show, <laughs> then they went out and lost. And people will say, hey, y'all got a pivot curse on I don't fighters. really know if it's a lot of UFC well, fighters. Well, we've had Fred. some UFC fighters <laughs> on the show. And then they, people will say, you got a pivot curse. But we did you. You didn't lose yeah. boxing. We did Haney. He didn't lose. Deontay? This is the, Deontay, he didn't lose. You talking about my man Uzman. I know you talking about <laughs> I mean, no, it was some other stuff. Not just Uzman. It was, it was uh, somebody else on the show, too. That okay, Fred, lost. is your out of sign you too? Okay. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right, and I love leave. those guys. Good dude. But I'm, this is more so for the fans, right? My thing is this. Hard work. Like, there's no, there's no substitute for that. You get out what you put in. The daily deposits. You know, and, and can you speak? Are you superstitious? Like, do you believe in that shit? Um, I, I was superstitious, but I'm not because for a long time, like, I didn't want to talk about death or none of that. And 
after my crash, I didn't have any wheels set up. I didn't have my wheels set up, nothing set up, my trust, nothing. So for like months, we talking about death and <laughs> who I'm gonna get this to, that to, and my kids get this, this and that and this percentage. And we talking about, you know, school funds and all that. And, and for me, like, it made me uneasy talking about it at first. I'm like, like, in the black community, that's taboo, like, just to be talking about death and talking about stuff you don't want to happen because we think it's going to happen. So I was like, man, I, I was, like I told Al, I was like, man, this kind of bugging me out a little bit. Keep talking about my death. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know I know it needs to happen, so we're going to keep talking about it. And, you know, we were talking about it for, like, eight months, and and nothing happened. So, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't too much believe, and I believe... You know, stuff just happened to us, you know, and I just believe cause and effect too. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, and I believe I believe in hard work, hard work, smart work, and just doing it, doing it the right way, and just keeping up with technology. Because a lot of times, you know, even with me, like I was so hard headed, stuck in the old school boxing way, and wearing sauna suits, and mm -hmm. you know, sweating crazy, not drinking water like that, and. It took my nutritionist Elliot basically just to, you know, tell me like he had to retrain my whole brain. Right. Just drink water, cause I was like, man, you sure? He was like, yeah, man, just drink water, like drinking a gallon and a half a day. Like now I'm drinking a gallon and a half a day. And I wasn't doing that back then. Like I was barely drinking two liters. And I'm in a hundred and something degree gym. Dehydrate. I'm running five, six miles a day. Like I'm dehydrated, but I had to dehydrate myself. Well, I felt like I need to dehydrate myself just to lose weight. Yeah. But that's not how you how you go about it, it's about calories. But I ain't understand the, I, I guess it's an older person game, the slow process, you know, it's more of a slow process, losing calories and, and still drinking water because your body like 90, 80% water. Right. So you need that to function. And I didn't really understand that. So it's about hard work, but it's about, you know, being smart about it and keeping up with technology and getting the right people with you like, I feel like boxing is kind of a team sport, especially now, because I got a nutritionist, I got a coach, you know. My friend Jordan helped me out with different things. My dad helped me out with different things. So I got a lot of people in place where they where they help me out, especially Al and um, Showtime. Everybody helps me out with different things and make sure what I do is easier and I just focus on boxing. Chan, did you say before you came in though, you said you wanted him to help you out with your gear, huh? Cause you no, no, no. You remember no. you said you said you was no. gonna ask him. I said he changed. Why he changed? He changed because <laughs> I saw him in that first press conference, and now I see his little uh, Black Panther fro. <laughs> 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 And the first time we met you, you was tight, you was clean. Yeah. And I saw, I was looking at the press conference, that first one, you had on the white shirt open, you had on the black suspenders, yeah. you had on the Malcolm X glasses. Yeah. And I'm like... Man, it wasn't suspenders. It was, <laughs> it was like a hoster. It was like a hoster. I didn't know if you if you went the Muslim. I didn't know what... <laughs> I didn't know what... Was that stra strategic or something? Because I, I, I didn't see that You dressed you. like the A-side. Yeah. yeah, I'm... I'm just fly, like. That, that, so I will fly. Like I switched, I switched it up. Like in California, I had, you know, Alexander McQueen had some fresh stuff on, and then in, in New York, you know, I had more of a, a chill, a chill, you know, style. But I, you know, I still had some fresh stuff on. So, you know, I just, I just, I put that stuff on. And, but it, but I got is the, are the glasses prescription? Was oh they, yeah, they, nah, they prescribe. They prescribe because they stop. But you don't wear them during the fight. Nah. Can you see? Can you see that motherfucker in front of you? Yeah. Nah, I, I can't see far, but I can see. I can see up close. Oh, That's okay. why I be like, why y'all always like talk about my my eyesight? I don't need to see far away. Like we in a ring. Yeah. Like I can see him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he, he ain't doing nothing you can't see. Yeah, I ain't doing nothing I can see. Like I can see him. In your last fight against uh, your Dennis Ugas, your mouthpiece fell, and he kind of rocked you. Right, and yeah. I don't, boxing doesn't seem fun to me or like something you should laugh <laughs> and enjoy. So your mouthpiece falls out, he hits you, you hit the, the ropes, you started laughing. What the hell was funny? <laughs> nah, well I started laughing because, and he didn't rock me, he really surprised me because like I had a partial in my mouth, basically. Partial? From a, from a car crash. Okay. So I had a partial in my mouth, like my three, the three front teeth. So I put glue in it every day and put it in my mouth. 
and put it extra tight. But usually, like Danny Garcia fight, I took my partial out and I put my mouthpiece in. But this fight with you guys, I put my partial in. So when we, it's basically a bridge, it's how to bridge. So I put my bridge in, and when we fight and he knock my mouthpiece out, the first thing that come to my mind is my teeth on the ground. <laughs> oh, like, I, the first thing come to my mouth, man, my, damn, he didn't knock my teeth out. Like, so, I'm not wor- like, he disappeared. Like, I don't see him anymore. Like, he's just gone. Because you were looking dope. Yeah, I, as soon as my mouthpiece came out, I started, I, I, you see my mouth was like that, like, because <laughs> like, I was trying to feel for my teeth to see if it's in my mouth, but I'm looking at the ground to see if my teeth on the ground, because that shit would have been embarrassing in the head that, that he knocked my teeth out. Like, yeah. that would have been the first ever. So, so I, as soon as he knocked me out, I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, crap. And then he just, dude, hit me, dude. And then when he hit me, I fell into the ropes, but I'm still, I did like that. And then it's the end, so I just smile. I'm like, okay, it's in now. Like, <laughs> now I got my go. teeth. Yeah, I, I was like, I got my teeth. It's good. I got 10 across the front. Yeah. And my kids will jump sometimes and hit my face, <laughs> and I'll be the same way. I'll be like, Because <laughs> 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 you don't want to be the dude with that big ass jack o' lantern ass face smiling. Yeah, yeah man. You thought about that in the middle of right. that? That's man. the big one. Yeah, because I've been so embarrassed, man, my teeth on the ground. Like, man, and Instagram, Twitter is ruthless, so, man, that destroyed me. It made you look tough as hell, though. You know what I mean? Like, for, for a guy that's won as much as you have, that would have been the first time you actually looked like what you had been through. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> nah, <laughs> man, man that was, boy, that was... Boy, screenshot at that, that would have been everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, bro, you know, I haven't really heard you the way we've heard you in, in these press conferences. Yeah. Right? It, it's different. And Channing, before we really got started, mentioned respect. A lot of times when you don't have a necessary level of respect for your opponent, it really ain't nothing to say. Right? Because okay. you know, I'm supposed to go out here and win this fight. And if I win it, they're going to be like, oh, that's what Errol was supposed to do. I remember y'all two met up one time and somebody was videoing it and they said, and you was like, nah, if I beat him, they're going to say he's too small, yeah. right? Then he shoots back at you. And then we get into the press conference and he talk about the big fish. And you're like, hey, man, you can't get Moby Dick with a fishing pole. When you think about Bud and some of the confidence that's coming across in the sense that he said you're going to be the 11th in a row if you get out of line <laughs> and you... Said, I live my life <laughs> out of line. <laughs> but when you think about the confidence he's displayed and the way that you've gone back at him, do you feel like as much as you think you can go into this fight and win, he feels the exact same way? Oh, for sure. I feel like the press conference, everything leading up and everything, we bring greatness out of each other. Just period. That's just that's just what it is. You know, we just we bring in that greatness out of us. So and like you said, if I truly feel like somebody not on my level or they just pure garbage, like I'm super dismissive of that person. Like I'd be like, yeah, all right, whatever. I'm just gonna be like, I'm a, it's gonna be a one-sided ass whooping. Like I'm just gonna, you know, say whatever I say and just leave it alone at that. Like, but with him, is it, is definitely more excitement. I feel like, uh, you know, I've been off for a year and a half, so I just feel like. Powers, he bring excitement to my life. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I feel like this is the fight. Like for the past, you know, Florida Pacquiao, like box office, that's I don't think nobody gonna beat that. But I feel like we talk about two fighters and you know, their mentalities and how they are, and you know, his mentality is kill, my mentality is kill, you know, we might retreat, but we gonna our mentality again is to kill again as soon as we we good. So I just feel like we just meant to clash together. It just meant to happen. So I wasn't gonna let this fight go past because of egos or pride or, you know, somebody want this and we couldn't make it happen. So, you know, I feel like we just had to make it happen. I can't remember who you were talking about, Chan, and we were saying a guy had an opportunity to pick his fight. It might, it might have been Devin Haney and Lomachenko, and you ask him why. I want to ask you that. You mentioned earlier um, Leonard yep. Hagler. There was Leonard Durand. We saw Hagler Hearns. And a lot of 
the negativity that surrounded Floyd was that he didn't fight people when they wanted them to fight. You mentioned Floyd and Pacquiao, but Pacquiao wasn't what he was at, at his height when it happened. Just in this year, we've seen Ryan Garcia and Tank. We saw Devin Haney, Lomachenko. Now, from a boxing perspective, skill, talent level, killer instinct, this is the best fight that boxing can make. You could have gone up to junior middle. There's like Charlo and Zhu and Castano. There's those guys. But you stayed for this fight and didn't take other fights for this fight. And listening to you talking, you like, I, you sound like a dude that, and pause, you sound like a dude that met his wife. Yeah. That like, this is the one I have to have. Why do you feel so strongly about fighting Bud Crawford? I feel like this is a legacy fight. I don't know if y'all ever watched Legendary Nights. They used to come on HBO, it's on YouTube, y'all can look it up. But it had Legendary Nights, they had like Sugar Ray Leonard, Tommy Hearns, they had the, uh, the whole through like training camp, the press conferences leading up to the fight and everything, what happened after the fight. So, and I used to watch that as a kid all the time. And so I want that to be, you know, part of my history. I want somebody 20, 20 years, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, you know, watching a documentary and saying, man, I want to have a fight like Earl Spence and Terrence Crawford, or, you know, I want to have that fight, or I want to do this just like Earl Spence and Terrence Crawford did, just like how I'm talking about something that happened in the 80s, 70s. You know, I want I want that to be, you know, my legacy where people, where, where kids talk about and watch it on YouTube or whatever they got, social media, they got it. 30, 40 years from now, it's gonna be something new. You know, they watch it and they get excited about it and they watch it before they amateur tournament and they get super excited about it and they wanna have that same type of, you know, legacy defining fight that, you know, I'm willing to have. I gotta ask you about this too, because it's funny talking about the underdog thing. And so when I saw you was underdog, I started doing research and listening to people talk and listening to all that. And they say, you're bigger, you're stronger. You throw more, you punch harder. His IQ is higher. And I know you've heard that. Crawford's IQ is higher. What does that mean and how does it make you feel when you see all these analysts? And I don't know what that, I don't know if it tests your intelligence or what it is. What is boxing IQ mm -hmm. and how do you take it when there are people out there saying that your opponent's boxing IQ is higher than yours? I feel like they say his boxing IQ is higher because he he he's more he's more talented, you know. He does different things. I'm not saying he's more skillful than me, but he's he's definitely talented. And he use you know he uses talent like he move around the ring, he use angles, you know. He switches left to right, you know. He does different things. But when you look at me, you know, I can stand in the pocket. I show that I can box, you know. I show I, I been show I, I show I can rough it up. I show I can hit, you know. I show I can use speed. I just show a lot of things. So people just just want to say stuff at the end of the day. <laughs> you know, they just want to, oh, his boxing IQ. They say his boxing IQ is better just because, just because he's a boxer. You know, with me, I consider my style passive aggressive. And, <laughs> and <laughs> passive aggressive. And like me, I'm not getting hit with crazy shots or, you know, taking crazy amounts of punishment just to land shots. Like I'll be in the pocket with people touching people up, and I'm bird and I'm not even getting hit like that again. And you after the fight, my face not all lumped up, swollen and bruised up, and I'm right there in the pocket. So I tell them saying, people, what what type of IQ did that take to be right there in the pocket with somebody and not get badly beat up like I'm badly beating somebody up or punishing somebody? Why I'm not getting punished the same way? You talked about legacy. You ever heard the Jay-Z song, uh, What More Can I Say? Yeah. When he's talking Spaniards, and then at the end he drops the mic. You mentioned legacy. What does this fight, because it made me think of that song. You're talking about Bud, you know, not heavyweights, but big dogs. Yeah. What does it do for the sport of boxing? I don't know what it do for the sport of boxing, really, because boxing is, is more business savvy now than it was you know, a long time ago, like, and I, I credit Floyd to that. Mm -hmm. You know, Floyd really just changed, you know, changed boxing and made it more business-wise and made it more, I'm gonna get my bang for my buck or, 
you know, if I fight somebody, I, I should get paid, you know, the most or to fight whoever I'm fighting. And he just, you know, so I don't think, I don't think it'll change much, but it, it definitely open eyes. And I think it, it might light a fire on the people bus to make these big fights happen. And then like I told people, I say, yeah, I gotta buy these, these pay-per-views. Like, yeah, I gotta show a lot, most of these fighters, a lot of these fighters that there is a reward in taking risks. So, and if you don't buy these pay-per-views, you don't come out and watch these fights, especially when they're super competitive fights or it's a chance that either fighter could lose. Mm -hmm. And you're not coming out there, they're gonna be like, man, I'm gonna get paid the same fighting Joe Blow than fighting him. So why would I fight, you know, somebody that's on my level when I can fight this guy and get paid the same? So it's just, it's really all on the fans. Once they start r really supporting and start, you know, buying these pay per views, especially when they're super ultra competitive fights, then you're gonna get these big fights because the guys in the suits are gonna be like, we gotta make these fights happen because this gonna draw them out of money. Cause all they know, all they know is numbers. At the end of the day, that's all they care about. So if if the numbers right, they gonna make a fight happen. Do we expect a mic drop at the end? Oh, after I beat him? Yeah. Well, I, nah, I ain't dropping no mic. <laughs> nah, I'm all about what's next. <laughs> e, e, I got it. I need one follow up, fellas. This is my first one. I need one follow up because I've heard you say I'm gonna break. I'm gonna break this man. Mentally, physically, and spiritually. How do you do that to a person? Just hitting him? Like, like I know you're punching a dude. Like, if you come hit me seven times, like, I'm going I'm to be scared. But yeah. to break a motherfucker mentally, spiritually, and physically? That's a lot like you. Yeah. That's taking a person's soul. Yeah. And I saw you say that in front of this man. And he sat there and stared at you with that little ugly fro he got. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I saw y'all sitting down. I'm like, damn. Like, what, what is that? What? What? How do you do that to a person? Man, it's just it's just a certain look they give. Like after like, I don't like. It might be in the middle of the rounds. It might be in the later rounds. But it's just a certain look that it, it's like a hopeless look on their face. And I feel like that's more. That's more gratifying just knocking somebody out. Like if you punishing somebody, if you punishing a knockout, okay, he got knocked out, his body good. But if you punishing somebody, keep beating on him, keep beating on him, keep beating on him, it gets to a point where, you know, they might not come back the same or they, they, the next fight might not be the same because they do body and took so much punishment. Yeah. So I feel like when you see that hopeless look on their face or they just, they don't look like how they look before before the bell rung, the confidence. He's like, he he know that, man, like, this, this is about over. Or I'm gonna just keep fighting my heart out. And he just fighting my heart now. He ain't even fighting with his brains or he ain't even listening to his coach because he's so tired or fatigued or, or hurt. You know, his basic, he fighting with his his brain to go just not going to survival mode and going to flea mode. So he basically just fighting off per instinct. Like I said, I got well, I got two three months of mortgage on you. <laughs> so if you get your ass knocked out now, I got three kids. <laughs> but even saying that to you jokingly, but the pressure of it. I saw you with the Dallas Cowboys. I saw you hanging out with them, and I I've heard that that the Cowboys are flying to the fight. Like, you got all them people coming. Does that add any more pressure to you? Like, knowing the people, knowing that we gonna be there, knowing that everybody's watching, knowing that there's NFL teams watching, knowing that there's just, there's celebrities all day that love you and come to watch this fight. Did you even think about that before the fight? Like you saying, playing video games and playing dominoes. Do you think about the world is now here? They're a professional team. They are everybody here. I don't want to stress you out now, no, no, but no. do you, do, like, does that do anything to you? And when does that turn off? That you know your homeboys, you know your friends, but when does that turn off? Well, I'm, 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 about, I'm going out here to do what I do. I got, it's not really a ritual I do, but it's like, it's something I did early in my career. Um, so basically, like, I'm watching, I like watching, like, let's say, kids from like Haiti or kids from these third world countries. And even in Haiti, like, they had to, they was eating mud pies 
just to fill their stomach up. Like, it had no nutritional value at all. They just eating it just to get food. And you just seeing kids from other countries and, and watching on TV, it, it gives me more of a, a it's more of a confidence booster for me because like, what am, what am I worried about? Like, I'm, I'm about to make millions of dollars fighting somebody. And it's people out here that don't have food to eat, don't have water to drink, don't have a lot of stuff, you know, and don't have protection. You know, little girls, all the little boys. And, and I'm worried about a fight. You know, so it it kind of shifted my whole mentality when I watch those when I watch those those type of documentaries, and it gets me focused. And it's like, man, I, I really don't have nothing to be worried about. Like I'm here worried about a fight when people are going through way more than than I could ever, even imagine. So it just everything just go out the window, and it's like I'm blessed, and I had like all the worries go away because what I didn't watch and what I seen. You know, how do you compare those things or eliminate the things you have been through? I have a friend and his saying is, it could always be worse. Definitely. You know, and I've heard that, but that doesn't stop people from understanding their circumstances or feeling what they've been through. And Fred mentioned earlier how some of the fights have been delayed or pushed back or whether it was accidents or detached retinas, all the things that you've been through and now having your family and you growing closer to them, how do you detach that part of your life and just find gratefulness and appreciation in where you are now? Knowing what I got, like, I feel like the accidents and the car crash, I read it, everything that happened to me, it gave me more satisfaction on what I have. And, you know, like you said, things could be worse. Mm -hmm. Things could always be worse. So for me, I'm like, man, I can still think, I can still talk, you know, I can still do what I love, you know, and my kids deserve better. And I'm out here, it's a quote unquote, playing, like, you know, hanging out or, trying to have fun and doing different things. And I'm out here playing and, and I, I got to a point where I really forgot, you know, what I was doing it for. And quote unquote, I kind of, I, I swerved off because I forgot what I was doing it for. I forgot I was doing it for my kids and my mom, my dad and everybody around me. And I got caught into the lifestyle, quote unquote. And, and I feel like basically I just, he knocked on my door. I feel like that car crash was was a knock. Like you said, one to come before destruction. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that car crash was basically a warning. It was basically knocking my door. Like, hey man, you better wake up. Quit playing. If you keep playing, I'm gonna come and get you. So, <laughs> so you better lock in. Yeah. So that's why I've been doing it ever since. So I just feel like everything that happened to me, like you said, cause and effect. Even my eye injury, I think it was from it was from my wreck, because it's the same eye that was swollen and messed up. So, so like I said, everything could be worse. You know, I bounce back every time. You know, I just I just gotta lock in, just stay focused, and and just finish this out. I feel like I, I got one of the, you know, especially when I win, I got probably the best story in boxing, shoot, maybe sports, period. Just everything that been going on and then even the stuff that people don't know that didn't happen. And people just see the list of beasts and stuff that, that, they, that come to the news, but the stuff they don't know that happens in the dark, they don't even know about that definitely didn't happen. So for me, it's just about staying focused, doing right, and I finally got a third chance at this and I got to do it the right way and basically do it 100% and leave no regrets, no nothing, because I bounced back. Now it's time to make a success story. And when I get this fourth title, I feel like, you know, I can, re I probably can retire, but I won't. Hey, that's a narrative, by the way, that you are the guy that has gone off the path and you're fighting a man that eats, sleeps, and breathes boxing. That's in plenty of articles that when this fight was made, 
that that could be a determining factor in who wins this fight. How do you feel that people do now paint you? And one of them said, self-admitted, which you have here, that you've done things that have taken you away from the path you should be on. Do you feel like all of those, how do you feel about hearing those things and are all those things behind you enough where it's all about July 29th? Oh, it's all about July 29th. Like, when people say different things, I get it. You know, like I said, I'm rational, I get it. it. But it's all about July 29th and I'm here for a reason and we wouldn't be fighting for the undisputed without me. Cause I'm the guy that captured all three of those belts and basically made this fight happen. When he was trying to fight four or five years ago, would, that wouldn't have been a super fight. That would have been two good fighters fighting each other. Like, he wouldn't have fought Sean Porter. He wouldn't have fought Kell Brook. He wouldn't have fought basically anybody. He got Vic, Victor Postal and Yorkers Gamble. So, you know, that would just been two good fighters fighting each other. Now it finally makes sense because we getting the lion's share of the money, we getting the most money that we would have got prior to that. Five years ago, we definitely wouldn't have got it, near enough money we get now. So I feel like I'm the one that really led us to this point because I captured all the bills regardless of what happened. And now we're here. Channing spoke about uh, being in Vegas, you know, fighting in front of celebrities, the Cowboys. You know, RC spoke about family. You know, the last couple of fights, you've been home, you know, in front of family, friends, you know, maybe childhood, your teachers, could have been anybody. But there's a different type of excitement that goes with that being at home. And now you have to shift that and go to Vegas. Time change, time difference. You know, in terms of preparation and mindset, does, how does it affect your, your mindset having to go fight in Vegas? None of that stuff affect me. I'm different. My first world title was in Sheffield, England. And um, I had been off my longest layoff, like a year and some change, waiting on him to get better to fight him. So my mentality, it, it don't matter where we fight it. It could be, it could be everywhere. It could be anywhere. It could be Omaha, Nebraska, for all I care. <laughs> you know, for me, I'm all about taking something. So I, I got one job that's to put my hands on him, touch him up, and get him out of there to get this belt and go about my way <laughs> with my kids. <laughs> and, and bro, you're a good dude, but to RC's point, you've been painted as the villain. You're the guy that doesn't love boxing. You're the guy that parties and drives yeah. and gets in accidents. Yeah. Are you, uh, have you embraced that? Are you cool with that, with that narrative that you're, you're not the straight edge guy? Because that becomes the villain. That becomes the, the, the wild guy that just knows how to box. Are you cool with being you and some people really not liking you? Um, oh yeah, for sure. I mean, that, that's, what come, that's what come with it. I feel like that, that's what makes a greater scenario when you got the villain and the so-called... Um, got the so hero. Yeah, so-called hero. But so. everybody wants to be the hero though, RC. <laughs> It, I don't, do, man. I you don't, don't want to be the hero? I don't care, man. It's all about my kids eating and staying in private school <laughs> and my mom and dad, my mom and dad wiggling their toes at night. Like, <laughs> <laughs> hey, that private school, a bitch. Ain't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, I don't care about being a villain, yeah. superhero, whatever, whatever it takes, man. I just want to get the job done, get up out of there and go kick it with my family. So I'm not worried about being a villain. I can be whatever they want me to be. It's just me and him in the ring at the end of the day. Everything else shuts off, and it's just me and him. You are a superstar. The reason everything you said about why this fight is big and your part in it is 100% truth. Boxing is seeming to return to those glory days that you said you wanted to be a part of, those legendary nights. Canelo signs a new deal with PBC. And there's already chatter. First fight, Charlo. At the end of that, they say Errol Spence. Being a superstar as you are, is that something you're looking to be a part of in the future? It's something I, I definitely, I definitely consider. But right now, I'm just my 100% focus on Terrence Crawford. Like 
it has been no talks about Canelo, t talking about Canelo or nothing. Like it's it's been all Terrence Crawford. So even when it was talking about Keith Thurman, and it's been all Terrence. My my thing was, I, I mean, I want I want Terrence. Like, yeah, Canelo cool. Like that's a super fight. You know that's great money. But my whole thing, Terrence Crawford, great money too. And this is more of a legacy fight for me. So. Is 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 more Terrence Crawford and Canelo. I'm not I'm not worried about Canelo. My dog from Houston. Hopefully Jamal get their fight and 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 wash his hands with him. How does July 29th end with your hand raised? What do you have to do to beat Bud Crawford? I just gotta beat myself. I, I feel like I just gotta beat myself. Listen to my coach and. <laughs> A lot of guys, when they get in big fights, they get out of character. They want to do something different or or have a different style or sh show something different. But, you know, I'm going to be myself, keep doing what I've, I've been doing. Nobody st stopped it yet. So if I got to step to him, I'm definitely going to step to him. Y'all already know how I fight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, box with him. I try to box with him. I'm gonna do whatever it takes to win. But I'm de he, he's definitely, I feel, is it, gonna is gonna is gonna welt to me, and um, I'm just gonna be in his face, 24/7. So I feel like he definitely gonna come ready. I feel like he trained hard. He always focused. He's in shape. Like you said, boxing is his life. But I feel like. I'm different, you know. I'm hit, I'm that apex predator. Like he's a predator too, but I find I'm a bigger predator. So I'm definitely gonna I'm definitely gonna get him, regardless of what he brings to the table, regardless of what he do, regardless of how mean he is, coaches or or whatever. You know, once we get in the ring, it's just me, him, and the rest to stop the fight. That's all it is. Hey man. He gonna he gonna throw a thousand punches. <laughs> hey man, we look <laughs> we look we look forward to it. And I'll say this to end: we got an opportunity to sit with you before Ugas, and it was a really good interview. He brings the best out of you. Oh, yeah. This interview was excellent. You were different. You were excited. You cheesed the entire time, <laughs> no matter what you were talking about. And when you can find a dance partner that does this for you, it's the right call. I can't wait to see it, bro. Right. Yeah, it's gonna be big, and that's that's the thing. Like with Ugas, guys, like I, like I overly knew what I was already gonna do. To, <laughs> already gonna do. <laughs> so it was kind of like I'm doing the interviews. Like you know, I'm just talking. But it's, this fight is the first time I'm like excited about a fight. Like my like people even say like my energy and how I talk like everything is just different because I'm just I'm just overly joyed for this fight because I feel like this is the fight where you know I show I show people my 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 character and how I talk and and just show them everything different than before it was just like I was just going through the motions because I basically knew that what I was gonna do to him, so it really, it wasn't really much to me to say. Man, can't wait to see it, bro. I love it. Hey, yo. <laughs> now we go, hey, now it's time to go talk to Bud. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but that's crazy, right? Because they said he eats, sleep, boxing. Yeah. I read somewhere in the rematch clause where he said he don't know if he'll take it if he lose, or when he lose, as you might think. Do you believe him? He said he won't take it? Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I think he's too, too competitive to that. For that. But it, it just depends on how bad I beat him. Like if if I beat the beat the wheel out of him, he probably won't take it. But I think if it's if it's close enough, he'll he'll take a rematch. Right, right. It's, wow. It's scary wow. how calm y'all talk about taking a man's soul. <laughs> like when I when I go to fight people, like I be loaded up, like this nigga bite my lip. <laughs> and you be like, yeah, I'ma just uh I'ma just like take everything out of him when he don't even believe in himself no more. It's like going to the bathroom. It's like I man, I used to do it seven days a week, like box. 
So for me, it's like, it's normal to me. Like me watching box or me watch somebody get knocked out or blood or eye gushing. Like I be watching, you see people, my girl be like, ugh, and all that. And I just be looking like, cause it's normal. I just, like, damn. <laughs> that, that was what's gonna happen to him if he ain't keep his right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, just let me start explaining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so he could have had him if he so, went here. He's so calm like that. Who was that you scary. knocked out with the uh, the body shots? It was, it, it was early in the fight, dude. In the fight too. Oh. You, you hit him. You went left. Uh, Campo. I think yeah. You hit him. Yeah. Man, a, a Campo. Just, hey. Yeah. He really made mad because that was that was in Frisco at the store. And I was real disappointed. Because it was quick? Yeah, it was first round. And everybody came out to watch me fight. And this was like one of my first big fights in Dallas. And he went down first round. I was pissed. I was like, man. <laughs> but, hey, it was the, it was the last left, though. Yeah. Like, you could see it. It took, it took his whole soul. Because even when he was on his knee, he thought about it. He was like, I'm going to get up. Yeah. And then he's like, nah, I ain't going to get up. <laughs> Does that feel better? What's up? What? Not going to do that with a body shot. Cause it's like you, the whole thing of a, like, uh, okay, he going down, but you had a nigga in the rim. He, like, he, like RC yeah. said, he taking knees up, he looking at yeah, you, yeah, holding his side. It was better. <laughs> With Tank did Ryan, it was kind of, it was yeah. like, it was like, damn, like, it, it kind of more like demeaning. It was like, damn, like he went down for body shot. Like. Hold up. Limitless. Take a stomach cow, pinning it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. On the mission, got me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless. Take a stomach cow, pinning it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. On the